Hello. My name is Dr. William Campbell. I'm an infectious disease specialist at St. Luke's Hospital, and I would like to discuss with you and present to you some of the information that we know about COVID infection. Actually, the infection caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 causes the infection that we call COVID-19. The number 19 is used because it became apparent in the year 2019. What I'd like to do is just show you what the virus is and give you a little rundown of how the virus makes one ill and then compare it with some of the other problems that we have at this time of the year. On a slide here, you will see this cartoon, which is a description of the virus. And the virus is made up of genetic material called uh, RNA, and it is packaged in a series of proteins and lipid molecules that give us this capsule that you probably have seen in television and on the newspapers. Um, this capsule is made and covered with various lipids, or like fatty materials, and that's why the virus is relatively easy to, de to inactivate with soap and water and good hand washing and disinfectant use. So it doesn't last very long on countertops and whatnot, particularly if people are cleaning it, as well as in washing one's hands. When the virus comes into our body, this little spike here called the spike protein attaches itself to a receptor, and it attaches to a, a part of our body, a receptor called the ACE inhibitor number two. Um, and that's uh, a protein that's ubiquitous in our body, and many of you probably are on drugs called ACE inhibitors, which actually block that protein for the treatment of high blood pressure. Fortunately, those of us who are on those types of medications, that doesn't have any impact on the severity or the ability to acquire this virus. So if one has the virus come into your system, and here's a, a series of graphs. When you inhale the virus, and that's how the vast majority of the infection takes place, somebody coughs, droplets are produced, and you bring the droplets into your body either by inhaling them or maybe touching a surface that's just been recently infected and scratching your eyes where it could go in through the eyes. And so when that happens, it can set up shop in the body, mostly in the respiratory tract and in the lungs, and it can take up to two weeks before infections develop, should infections develop at all. Many people can acquire the virus and never actually become ill with it. But if it happens, most people, when they do get sick, uh, get sick after about four to six days. And when that happens here, a few days before, they start shedding the virus. And the virus is the blue color here. And that will persist for quite a while. And that can actually shed for up to six to 12 weeks, although you're not infectious with it during that time. Actual virus itself that is reproducible that can cause infection goes up high. And then over a period of uh, a few days, it actually drops down to zero. And that's what we call the um, ability to infect somebody else. So if you develop the infection and that happens to say three to five days after uh, you acquire the virus. You can infect people for up to two days before you become ill, before you even know you're ill. And then after that, for the first week or so when you're ill, you can also continue to secrete the virus out of your mouth and in coughing. And that's why masks are so important. They prevent you from coughing on somebody else. And if you're wearing a mask, it can prevent that from coming into you. And so then the virus goes away, and most people get better. So that's how it works. However, there are groups of people who do not get better, in which not only does the immune system fight the virus, it then goes into overdrive and doesn't check itself and then begins to fight itself. And so that's where we run into problems. And the problems are manifold. Early on in the infection, you test you typically have pulmonary symptoms. You run fever, you have a cough, you feel tired, exhausted, just like having the flu or many other viral infections. Something that's rather unique to this virus is that many people lose their sense of taste and smell. It's really very unique to this, uh, and that's one of the things that we're always asking people, did you lose your sense of taste or smell? 
Less frequent appearances are diarrhea, nausea, sore throat, and occasionally various skin lesions. Now, many people get better from that. In fact, 85% of people who acquire the infection do well, get better on their own, and never really become seriously ill. However, there are other groups of people who do become seriously and even critically ill. And we do know there are risk factors for that. And that's what we call comorbid associated infect, uh, risk factors. And those of us who have cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, bad heart disease, those of us who have diabetes, those of us who have high blood pressure, those of us who have chronic lung illnesses, such as emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and those people who have kidney disease, bad kidney disease or on dialysis, or if you're over the age of 65, if you are any of those types of comorbid situations, you have a greater risk of developing severe infection, I'm sorry, severe disease as a result of the immune, uh, in fact, the immune system going into overdrive. And that causes neurological problems like strokes, respiratory distress that we call adult respiratory distress syndrome. In children, we see something called multi-system inflammatory disease. There is heart disease, there's acute kidney injury, liver injury, and various thrombotic complications, both strokes and arterial. And it's this kind of constellation that when this develops, uh, you have life-threatening infection. So when we think about COVID, we try to think about it in a number of ways. Number one, how can we prevent the infection from occurring in the first place? And the best way to do that is through good hand washing and good mask wearing, both uh, for you as well as to protect others. That's very important. Hopefully in a few months we will have a vaccination program out in which people can be vaccinated against. One of the important things at this time of the year is to be sure you get your flu vaccination because the last thing we need is for people to have flu infection and COVID at the same time, and yes, that does happen. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can give medications at the time of the infection, remdesivir, uh, and some things called monoclonal antibodies, and that can sometimes ameliorate the infection. If there are problems with people going into what we call the immune response overdrive or cytokine storm, we give dexamethasone or other steroids to prevent that. So that's how we treat the disease in people. But if you're sick or you're wondering what's going on, you may be saying, doesn't this seem like everything else that can happen? And the answer is, Actually, it does. And so what are the big things that we see at this time of the year? People come down with common colds. And what's a common cold? Uh, cough, runny eyes, sore throat. Uh, you tend not to run fever, or if you do, it's a low-grade fever, stuffy nose, and just not feeling very well, and it goes along for three or four days. Now, some of these symptoms could be identical, identical to COVID. What about flu? Well, the flu comes on suddenly. When you get the flu, you're almost sick within hours of its onset. COVID tends to creep into people over a period of hours to days. You also have cold, you have high fever, you can have a runny nose, and yes, you can have diarrhea and other problems like that, and intense body aches. How does that look like COVID? Actually, it looks very similar. So even symptoms of flu can be very problematic. What about the COVID symptoms? Well, we talked about that earlier. That's with fevers, cough, uh, shortness of breath that you can also have with flu, um, and the unique symptom of losing taste and smell. That you don't see with the other two. But what I'd like to emphasize is all of this is very similar because they're all respiratory tract infections. And so the respiratory and tract infections tends to have similar type of manifestations. So if you come down with any symptoms at all, what I suggest that you do is contact your doctor, give a quick rundown of what's going on, and your physician can make an assessment as to whether you should be treated for these or to be tested for COVID-19. Uh, at this time of the year with what's going on with the severe epidemic, uh, all of us tend to side on getting tested to be sure you don't have COVID, not only for your own health, but to help identify people that may be in contact with you who could also be at risk. 
So that's how we look at all these things. Is it a sneeze for a cold? Is it a flu or something else? And the answer is it's rather hard to tell in many cases. Please contact your physician for advice. And if there's any questions, do get tested. And that concludes my presentation for now. And I shall be open at another uh, opportunity for questions, which I invite from everybody. Thank you for your time.